So welcome to uh, the third part of the Easy Build tutorial. Today we'll cover a couple of more advanced topics. Uh, and I got the date wrong, but you know today's date. Uh, so this is part three. Part four is still coming, is, is still being planned. I'm working together with Luca from CSCS to um, get the contents together for this part of the tutorial, because that's new, the gray specific part is new. Um, I will plan a date. I guess it will be something around end of April, maybe, um, for the last session. That's fine. We discussed it yesterday already in the software team. Okay. End of April, early May. Yeah, something like that. Is Whatever is fit. Um, this is just as a reminder. So the, the tutorial itself is on the website for the, the demos. It's mostly demos today. There's, I think, maybe one exercise, but we'll probably won't have time to um wait for people to solve it you can solve it by yourself the important point here is make sure you use the the centrally installed um, software stack otherwise you'll be installing lots of stuff from scratch um, load the easy build module that's available there as the the main way to run easy build there's one exception in one of the sections today but i'll cover that in detail and also make sure easy build is properly configured um, to use your home directory, but for the build directories, use a local uh, temp directory. And this is also something we'll have to change for one of the parts today. Uh, this is the rough timetable. I halfway expect that it won't take three hours, but let's see what happens. Uh, we can definitely, we definitely have enough time to cover all of that. Uh, so that should be okay. So let's start with um, using easy build as a library. So for this, the, the, configuration you have to do and put is very basic. Just pick up the central software stack with module use and load easy build, and then you're good to go. Uh, so this is this first part here. So up until now, we've always used easy build uh, straight from the command line with the EB command, but you can also use easy build as a, a, a Python library. So you can talk to the easy build framework, use all the functionality that's available there um, parse easy config files, run commands, all of that, you can use the easy build framework for it as a library. There's a couple of important details that you have to uh, take into account. The first thing is that you have to set up the easy build configuration. So you have to make easy build read the easy build configuration files, the environment variables, um, and maybe also command line options, depending on how you write the script, um, where you'll be leveraging easy build. It's important that you call this setup configuration function first uh, before you do anything else with easy build. There's some functions, probably most of the functions in the easy build framework expect that easy build is properly configured. Um, and if you don't, you will run into trouble. So I can maybe show you what goes wrong if you don't do this. Um, so if you just start importing functionality, uh, from the easy build framework, for example, to read a file and you try calling that function with, uh, do we have an example? Let me check, I have a file here, test for example. So if I do read file test, then I get an ugly trace back. Um, okay, it's a directory, fine. Other example, this Python file here. Yeah. Anyway, um, a lot of stuff will, will go wrong if you try to um, directly use functions without properly setting up the configuration first. What you should do in a Python script or if you're running it straight in the Python shell um, is setting up the, the configuration. So for this, you import the setup configuration method or function and call it. So you don't have to give it any arguments. You can, and I'll explain some of those in a bit, um, because th this just sets up the easy build configuration in the background. It will produce some output and you'll get some um, return value here, uh, which you can use, but you don't have to. But from now on, anything you use from the EasyBuild framework will work as expected. 
and will also take into account your easy build configuration. So if you have easy build configured to use a different modules tool or to use Tickle as module syntax rather than the default Lua, this will be active in this session as well. Um, by default, um, the setup configuration function will pick up the command line arguments that are um, default in Python. Um, so if I would have started Python 3 with, well, if it's a script at least, with command line arguments and you call setup configuration without doing anything special, it will pick up those arguments as well and take them into account. Um, so that's useful when writing, Python, when writing Python scripts and we'll see that in a bit. And if you want to silence it so it doesn't print this line here where it gives you the location of the log file, you can use silent equals true um, like this. Silent equals true, and then we'll, we still get a return value, of, of course. Uh, so result equals, then it won't print you anything. If you don't do this, it will still print the location of the log file. So that's important. Whenever you want to use EasyBuild as a library, make sure you set up the configuration uh, first. Um, one important thing here as well is when you do this, um, and I have to peek here. Yeah, so this function returns two things actually, options and something else. There's something else uh, you can largely forget about, I think. Let's see. Yeah, that's a sort of an internal thing. But if you take the options, you also get a free temporary directory. And now it looks a bit weird because I've done it multiple times. Uh, but if you just do it once, you do the import, you do the setup, and let's do it silently. And then you use options.tem there. You get a temporary directory that is specific um, to this easy build session. That's useful. You can use this, but you should also clean it up afterwards. If you don't clean it up, it will stay there. Um, and to clean it up like we do here, uh, here in the example, so we can use the remove directory function that EasyBuild gives us. And then we remove options.tem there before we exit the session. And then everything is nice and clean. So this one will not be there anymore now. But that's important. This is the sort of minimal script you can run. When using EasyBuild as a library, you do the two imports, you set up the configuration, and you make sure you clean up the directory at the end. Of course, this doesn't do anything useful, uh, but this is like a, the starting point you should use uh, when running EasyBuild as a library. <clears throat> then what can you do? Um, a whole bunch of things, depending on what you're after, of course. Um, these file operations from the file tools module. Uh, so this example, um, does uh, it downloads a file, it computes a checksum for that file, and then it copies the file into the current working directory. So you see we're, we're importing a bunch of functions here um, from the file tools module, and then we use those functions one by one. So first to download the file, then to compute the checksum, and then to copy the file. Of course, to figure out how to use these functions, you can check the API in the EasyBuild documentation. So this link here points to the file tools module API. And for example, you can look for compute checksum here and it will give you the, the signature um, and it will describe the parameters that you can give it. So this is well documented. You can also do this straight from uh, the Python shell. Um, so let's import all of these actually like this and with help let's also do compute checksum you can get the help for that function here so the documentation is there um, right in your python environment or in the easy build documentation so let's see what this one does um, let's just copy it and say example one Oh, there it goes. Um, so 
what we're doing here is, <clears throat> first of all, we set up the configuration. We take one argument for the script. This is a download URL. We figure out the file name from the download URL and download it to a temporary location. So we're using the temporary directory that EasyBuild gives us. Um, once it's downloaded, we'll compute the checksum on this temporary path, print it. And then uh, at the end, we will copy the file to the, basically the current working directory. So if you try this, uh, we should make it executable and then give it a URL. So there's an example here, which downloads one of the files from the tutorial. And then we can just run it, give it the URL. And that will use EasyBuild to download the file, compute the checksum, and then copy it here in the current working directory. So all of this functionality is right there. You can use it. Um, you don't have to figure out how to do this with Python if EasyBuild knows uh, what to do. And since we didn't do anything special here when setting up the configuration, we get this line for the temporary log file. That's useful when something goes wrong. We can open the log file and check what happened and maybe figure out why it went wrong. And it's also useful that we can um, give command line options to this script. So any configuration option that makes sense for EasyBuild also makes sense here. So for example, EasyBuild has a download timeout option and we can put this longer or shorter um, to make sure there's enough time to do the download until it times out. So it will happily pick up that option and use it. And, and if you give it something wrong, uh, it will also complain that that option doesn't exist. So we get all of that for free uh, just by doing the setup configuration. That's also what's done here. Then another example is running shell commands. Um, for this, we have a separate module, the run module uh, with the run command function. Um, and this very short example we're running the make command after making sure it's actually there. So we run a which, which looks for the specified command in your path. Um, if it's not there, it will exit early with an error. Uh, and if it is there, it runs make with the arguments that you give it on the command line of the script. So let's say, let's call this run make.py like this. Um, let me first break it. So give a different command name to show you what it does. U plus X. And just to run make, the first thing it will do is make sure that the command is found. So make XX doesn't exist on this system. And then if we fix that again, and we just do run make without arguments, it will try to run the make command without arguments. And this expects a make file. So this goes wrong but I can give it options as well. And these will be passed to the make command. So it will run make dash version and then give me the output of that. So here you need to be a little bit careful when setting up the configuration, we pass an empty list to the arguments to prevent that the setup configuration picks up the arguments from here. Since these are uh, options to the make command, EasyBuild should not try and uh, use them to set up its configuration. That probably won't work. Okay, and that's working as expected as well. And then another uh, second, almost the last example, interacting with modules from a Python script. So we're basically running module commands like module load or module avail. Uh, example module.py. So this is a longer script. Um, but here we use the modules interface or the modules tool interface that EasyBuild provides. So it will set up this uh, modules tools, modules tool instance. And again, this will take into account the EasyBuild configuration. So if EasyBuild is configured to use LMOD, this will give you access to the LMOD command. If you're set up to use the environment modules uh, variant, then you will be talking to the environment modules tool. Um, but all of, the, all of the methods that are provided by EasyBuild will work no matter which tool you're using. So this should be a portable script. Um, so here we'll check what type of tool we're using, which version, 
how many modules are available, how many easy build modules are, are available. So we can run available without arguments or with the name of software. Um, we'll check how many modules are loaded. And then we will um, load the default bzip2 module. Um, so that's done here, dot load. And this expects a list of names because you can load multiple modules at a time. And before that, we'll check the environment. And also after loading the module, we'll check the environment to show what happened. Now, the changes to the environment are, of course, local to this Python script. As soon as the script is done, um, nothing will be changed in the environment anymore. So let's write this, make it executable, and show you what it does. So this one doesn't take any arguments. Um, or not any required arguments, anything we pass. Um, so I can actually show that, I think. So if we want to run this with the environment modules tool, we can try this. And then EasyBuild will try to use that. This will go horribly wrong because it can't find this modules tool. Um, and even I have to tell it use module syntax. Tickle, of course, when using this, but even then it will still go wrong because it can't find the modules tool. But this just shows that EasyBuild is picking up those additional configuration options. Uh, by default, it will run LMOD. I will see all this output, so it counts how many modules are there. It found one EasyBuild module. There's five modules loaded by default. If you run module list, you'll see the same thing. Um, before, there's no value set for the eb root bzip environment variable but if we load the bzip module we see it loaded here um, we can check the path to the loaded module so this comes from the central software stack that we provided for this tutorial and eb root bzip is set after loading the module but of course here as module list shows this was only local to this python session um, it doesn't change anything in your shell environment so I think this is also very useful um, when you're writing Python scripts to talk to a modules tool, you can do this via EasyBuild. And then the last example is parsing easy config files. So something very specific to EasyBuild um, where here we take an argument, the name of an easy config file, and then a list of parameter names that we want to um, inspect. We set up the configuration again. We parse the easy config file. And then one by one, we print the value of uh, these parameters. So inspect easy config dot by. Like this. Um, I think I have an example in my history, maybe. Maybe not, okay. So let's do this side by bundle. And let's see dependencies. So here I just give it the name of an easy config file and we'll use easy build to go and locate the file, parse the file and then print the value of the dependencies uh, parameter. And here we get, yeah, something that's already uh, pre-processed, so it's not a raw uh, value anymore, but we can give it a list of things as well. That may be a bit easier to look at. Software name, software version, tool chain. Um, so that's useful as well. Um, a little bit more about this. There's this function, helper function here, which we define ourselves because the, the standard API of EasyBuild is a bit, little bit awkward to work with to parse easy config files. It has a function for that, uh, but you have to use it in a specific way. Um, so it expects this additional value here next to the next to the location of an easy config file to parse it. And then for one easy config file, it may actually give you multiple parsed easy configs because there's a way in easy build to have multiple easy configs in a single file. Um, so that looks a bit weird. That's why we have this wrapper function that um, cleans that up a bit before we actually call it uh, here below. 
And of course, there's lots of functionality I haven't covered here. Anything that's mentioned in the, the Easy Build API, uh, you can use. So most of the useful stuff is in the tools module. Um, so anything in here you can leverage, you can play with the module naming scheme, uh, maybe inspect tool chain things. So there's a whole a lot of things you can do. So if you if you want to do some coding or if you're missing a feature in EasyBuild, uh, you could of course look into adding it into the EasyBuild framework itself, or you could write your own little Python script um, to do this and you just use whatever is there in the EasyBuild framework that is useful to you. So that covers this part. Any questions before we continue? So you've shown now how to use, let's say, yeah, the easy build tools, for example, sort of as a library function. So yeah, you, you can do this in spec also to, to get the Python prompt and, and load the spec as a library. And there, I remember, especially in the manual, they, they show this as a good example for, let's say, debugging and trying to understand why something goes goes wrong when you try to install mm -hmm. something you would like to see the exact value of some you know variable or some compiler or compiler flags and so on i suppose yeah. you can do something similar with easy build or or is it difficult if i wanted to oh, dig, you, dig into no, you, a, yeah you can definitely do it but you'll, you'll have to figure out which parts of, of easy build thing you have to use I, I don't have an example of that um but parsing the easy config file is already you're halfway there. That's also what EasyBuild does as the very first thing. It finds the easy config file, parses it, and then it calls another function. I would have to look it up to create the easy block instance. Um, so it figures out from the easy config file which easy block should be used, and it has a function for that. And then you, once you've you want to know which easy block is should be used, you can create an instance for that, and then you're very close to being able to inspect or even step through the installation yourself. Um, I don't have an example of that ready, but you can definitely do it. Yeah. So, so it's possible somehow to let's let's say I want to see the exact compiler flags and compiler build command, for example, run at a certain stage. You, yep. you can dig that out somehow. Okay. Good. Yes. Let Let me see if I can quickly get that working. Um, let's see. Uh, the easiest way is actually checking the code itself. Uh, it, it, will, it will be a bit too much work, I think, to do it on the fly here. But if um, if you're interested in that, I can cook up an example that goes, takes the next few steps. So create the easy block and then show you how you can set up the build environment so you can you can start inspecting it. Um, and in yeah, if you case, want to, you can also you can also yeah. find that information in the log file. Yeah, there's, there's other places as well, but maybe you want to do it more interactively or step through it um, mm. and basically look around a bit in various places. Yeah, that's, it's a useful use case. Yeah, you can okay, definitely the, do the, it, but the, I, yeah. I don't Maybe that was a bad example because it's true. I think with full logging, you can see that part, but th there could be things which are, let's say, not logged usually or, or you want to see some more details. So that it's this kind of Yeah, or, but, or just inspect I, uh, in, internal yeah. stuff, for example, inspect variables in the easy block or yeah not okay um, i get it you can definitely do this yeah i'll i'll it's a it's a good use case i'll try to come up with an example for that and and share it with you okay um so let's move on to the next part using easy build hooks um make sure i have a clean environment here okay um this is a little bit similar, but it, it, it's different. So it's also Python coding and essentially using the EasyBuild framework, but in a different way. Um, the main use case for um, hooks is to change the behavior of what EasyBuild does. So if you're doing an installation EB and some easy config file, and you somehow want to intervene in the middle of that and do something extra or do something different, um, that's what, what you can do with hooks. Um, so to use hooks, you'll have to implement a small Python module um, and tell EasyBuild to use it. So there's a there's a hooks um, 
configuration option, which you, for example, can set through easy build hooks. So let's uh, try doing that and make sure I don't have, I do have, let me clean that up. So we can tell easy build to use our um, hooks Python module. Um, and as if it's not there, easy build will probably complain, should complain. Uh, let's do the side by thing like this. Yeah. So if you give it something that doesn't exist, it gives up because if you configure easy build to do something, it will definitely try to do that. Uh, but if we touch the file, uh, it can be empty. That's okay. And then it will happily continue. Yeah. So you can configure easy build to use your hooks file by setting the corresponding environment variable. And then it's happy. So what can we do with hooks? Um, let's first look how which hooks are available. There's a long list of hooks that you can implement. Um, you don't have to implement all of them. You can choose only the ones you, you want or need to use. Um, and it's a very long list, but there's basically three different types. There's a start hook and an end hook. So the hooks are printed in the, in the order that they are executed. Or, or considered at least by easy build. So the start hook and end hook uh, are triggered at the very start and the very end of easy build. Um, there's a parse hook, which is triggered every time an easy config file is parsed and you can do something there if you want to. And then we have a whole long list of hooks basically for every step that is performed by easy build, fetch step, ready step, source step, patch step, repair step, and so on. Um, and there's a pre and a post hook for that. So you can, there's a hook that's triggered right before a step is started and right after a step is completed. And you can intervene in, in each of these locations. Uh, for the start and the end hook, um, important to know here is that the start hook is only triggered once, right after starting easy build, and then it's never triggered again. And similar for the end hook, it's only triggered at the very end. Um, and also only once per easy build session. Um, if you implement the start hook, so like this, so you can do, you define the start hook function, and then you can do whatever here, hello from the start hook, like this. Um, and now let's find an easy example. Let's do the, Silly bzip one and make sure it actually goes. And here we can already see that the start hook is triggered. So whatever you do in the start hook will be executed as Python code and you're basically um, intervening with what easy build does by default. What you do there is entirely up to you. You can run commands, you can um, use the easy build framework like we showed in the previous part uh, to talk to the modules tool. Uh, you can check environment variables, check the, the system you're on, the host name, whatever you want to do is, um, is possible. Also very similar for the end hook, of course, you just define end underscore hook as a function um, and it will be called uh, right before easy build um, ends the session. One important detail here is that you don't get any arguments to the start hook. Um, at this point, there's really nothing easy build Easy build can give you. Um, if you want to inspect the easy build configuration, so that may be interesting to do. Um, let's see, if I, I think it's this one build option. So you can you can inspect um, configuration options. So for example, debug. You can check whether the debug mode is enabled. And then let's hope I got this right. Yeah. So by default, the debug mode is not enabled. Let me make this a bit shorter so it doesn't run for that long. Okay. So by default, the debug mode is not enabled. But if you use dash debug, this should be set to true. So you can also inspect the easy build configuration. And maybe if you see a mismatch between the host and the easy build configuration, you can give up very early. So that's a very site specific thing um, that you can do in a hook, for example. So start and end hooks only trigger once. Don't take any arguments. The parse hook, 
um, which we can also implement the obvious name is parse hook. This one does take an argument. Um, you get the parsed easy config file here as an argument. So every time an easy config file is parsed, the parse hook will be triggered right after the easy config file is parsed. And at this point, the, you still get a, a raw easy config file. So you basically get the contents of the easy config file itself without any additional setup that Easybuild does at a later stage. Um, so at, at this point, you can actually intervene um, and change stuff. So for example, we can do uh, build opts. We can just inspect the build options for this particular installation. Uh, let me stop it a little bit earlier. Fetch. Yeah. So here we see the parse hook being triggered, um, which gives us the value of the build opts. That's useful. But we cannot only inspect the value, we can also change it at this point. So we can do build opts equal. Uh, example doesn't really matter this will of course break the installation but it doesn't matter too much and let's stop after the build step so we see it's actually being used uh let's see why didn't this get used build opts it's in here yeah. example so the example we injected here as build options was passed to the make command. There's other stuff being done as well that's being done by the easy block that's being used, but our build opts are being injected here. And then in this example, it breaks the installation. Um, so parse hook is very useful if you're if you want to change certain um, easy config files without changing the easy config files themselves. So you can do it programmatically. And you can, of course, do it uh, conditionally. So for example, only for BZ2, you can actually do something um, and not for something else. So this will still be triggered for BZIP, but it will not be triggered for anything else. OK. So just a quick question. question. So, yeah. so the, this step sure. right, was where you suggested, let's say you have this hypothetical scenario which I had where I would like to change the tool chain for or replace the tool chain for all my easy configs for example this would be the mm -hmm. place to do it right okay yes you, you can do it here you can change any easy config parameter because you do it very early right after parsing the easy config file and easy build will only take additional steps like looking for the, the tool chain or looking for um, I can show this as well so let's change the tool chain to name uh, Peter, whatever, say you have your custom tool chain version 1.0. This, this will go horribly wrong, of course. Again, uh, it's, well, it doesn't really matter. It, it will give up when it does the prepare step. Yeah, and here, here it even says tool chain Peter not found. So I'm using a tool chain that doesn't exist. And Easybuild isn't happy with that. Um, in this case, this is a uh, up, up, uh, a system tool change. If I change it to an existing one, this doesn't make much sense, but this should work. And let's do trace. So it shows us what's happening. Uh, preparing, so you see here, it's loading this tool chain as uh, the one we selected. So this is early enough that you can basically tweak whatever is in the easy config file or add additional stuff to it um, as you like. And again, without changing easy config files or without changing the easy build framework itself or figuring out where to do that. So the hooks are, are very useful. Um, of course, as, as you can tell, it's broken here for, for whatever reason, uh, but whatever you do in the hooks can also break the installation. So you have to be a little bit careful um, and it's probably recommended to do things conditionally. So um, uh, only for certain software names, or for example, in the start hook, you could say, uh, if not, I know what 
I uh, doing this easy build error. So this is how you report an error Um, this is how you report an error to easy build. Build log, we need to import this, of course. But here in the start hook, we're just saying that some environment variable has to be defined. And if not, it gives up very early. So this is like export mode, I guess. Uh, so here the start hook will trigger I have a missing import. So here it just says, you don't know what you're doing and then you're supposed to know what you can do. And if you set the environment variable, then it will be happy and it will continue. Um, so if you, you could have your own custom hooks that you, you don't want to, you want to make sure that are not used by accident, for example, that's also possible. Uh, and then the pre and post step hooks, uh, that's another example. So here you have to be a little bit more careful. Let's keep this, even though it breaks the installation, it doesn't matter too much. Say, um, if we do pre-built hook, here we get also one argument, but it's not the same one as for the parse hook. At this point, we get the parsed, uh, the prepared easy block. So not the easy config file, but the easy block that actually runs um, the installation. So if you just print this, it will probably show us uh, the build hook. Let's keep doing this. <clears throat> so pre-built hook here, it's running the, oops, running the build hook and it's showing us that we get an easy block instance. In this case, the bzip2 easy block because there's a specific easy block for bzip2. That's useful. We can also still access the parsed easy config file. Uh, through the CFG uh, variable and the easy block. And let's check build opts again here, like this. So here we get the value for the build options as well from the parsed easy config file. So in this, for the step hooks, you get both the easy block, which is fully prepared and executing the installation. And you still, of course, get access to the parsed easy config file as well. Uh, which was used to create the, the easy block. Uh, and again, of course, here you have to be careful. This will be triggered every time the build step is started, no matter uh, which software is being installed. Um, and what you're doing here is probably very specific to the software or to specific software. Um, so you wanna make sure you only do this for certain software names, certain software versions or under certain conditions. Um, some things to take into account here when using hooks. So you have to be a bit careful. This is a very powerful feature. You're basically jumping in between easy build somewhere. You can take additional actions. You can change things on the fly like, we're, like we do here. Uh, you can totally break things as well. Um, let's see how we can break something. If we do something stupid, like we change the name to none, for example, um, it's very likely that EasyBuild won't be happy with that. Yeah, so here it says, okay, you gave me a none that doesn't make sense and it just crashes and gives up. So you can very easily break EasyBuild through hooks if you're, if you're not careful. Um, or you could write a hook for a very specific use case for a specific software. And then when you're installing something else by accident, uh, you broke or you changed that installation as well. So make sure you add conditions um, and things like this to avoid uh, breaking things and make sure you test things well before you actually use the hooks in production, of course. Another thing to be a little bit careful with is, is template values. Um, let's see if we can give an example of that. We can just actually use this one, I think. So let's use this example, clean up this junk and just use this one. So what we're doing here is in the pre-source hook, um, 
we want to make sure that the software version that is specified in the easy config file is also found in the name of the source file. Um, if that's not the case, then something's very wrong and we want to give up or in this case, I'd just print a warning. So doing that check is quite easy. We, we loop over all the source files and the sources easy config parameter and we check if the version is a part of that. If it, if it is, uh, ah, okay, it's actually different. Um, we want, we were checking for hard coded versions in source file names. Okay, that's what, that's what's going on. Um, so we don't want to hard code the software version in the file name. We want to make sure that this template is being used. So of course, when doing this check, we have to make sure we're not looking at the, at the template because then the check is just useless. Um, so we have to make sure we get the easy config parameters without templates resolved. So that's what that's why we have to use this with statement here to make sure that templating is disabled when we inspect um, values of easy config parameters. Let me show you what goes wrong if you don't do this. So if we don't do the disable templating, um, this should work. And we can do the BZIP example again. Uh, don't need any of this. So here we all already get the warning uh, because we're, when we look at the value of the source file, the version is already in there because this is a fully resolved template. So of course the version is gonna be in there. If we do it with disable templating, Let's push this under there and let's also print the value here so you see what we're checking. Stop after uh, prepare. Oh, whoops, that was not correct. Of course, I'm doing this. Correctly printing the value. So now we're looking at this value, the, the one without the templates resolved. And this is actually the right place to check for hard coded versions. If we see this, we're happy. If we see a hard coded version, we complain, we print the warning, and, and we tell uh, the user, please use this version template instead. So don't hard code versions in names of source files. So if you want to be more strict in the easy config files you manage yourself, you can add additional checks. Um, through hooks like this, but you have to be a bit, little bit careful with templating. And then here, changing easy config parameters on the fly, which I showed for BZIP very quickly. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So you have to be a little bit careful depending on what type of easy config parameters you change. Um, so if you're changing a string value like built opts, like I was doing before, it's fine. You can just do assignments um, and that's okay. Sometimes you want to add to an additional, uh, add to an existing value rather, um, like we're doing here in the big Z example. So let me clean this up again and start over. Um, so what we want to do here when we're installing the big Z tool, we want to make sure that the readme file is also being installed, so being copied. Big Z uses the make CP easy block, which listens to the files to copy easy config parameter. And apparently for whatever reason, the easy config files included with easy build don't copy the readme file. And we want to fix that uh, in a hook. So we don't have to change all the big Z easy config files. So let's see what this does. Um, I think I have this prepared, yep. I will do a rebuild because I may have this already. Um, so the hook was in pre-install hook. So it will only trigger before the install step. Uh, it's already going wrong here. Ah, because I didn't properly configure easy build. I'm not using a local directory for the build path. So that's why it goes wrong there. So building should work. Yeah, now it's triggering the pre-install hook. Um, which injected the readme into the uh, files to copy. And then if we check where are things now in here, 
Okay, I'm still using the wrong installation directory, but that doesn't matter too much. In here, we can see that the readme file is also being copied, which it doesn't do by default. And to prove that it doesn't do that by default, I'll remove the hooks and do another rebuild and show you that it's not, I have to stop telling easy build to use the hooks. I do a regular installation, the readme file will not be there. So the hook has successfully triggered. Yeah, now it's not there when you do the default installation. So this way you can also, you can fix problems in easy config files um, by changing stuff. Now, what's important here is that um, we can use our inspect script, maybe files to copy. So the default value for files to copy is this, where it where it copies two binary files into the bin installation folder. This is a list of things to copy. And we don't want to overwrite this list. We want to add stuff to it. So we just want to do an append in this list um, when we do the hook. So that, that's where we have to be a little bit careful. Um, let me show you the wrong version. This doesn't work because when we take the value here, we're actually getting a copy of the actual value, not a reference to the original value. So when we append something to the list here, the append will work, but actually nothing is happening. And we're not actually changing the easy config parameter. If we do this update uh, method, so this is an update method for the easy config um, instance, then it does work. So whenever you're changing things like lists or Python dictionaries, so mutable values in Python, you have to be a little bit careful. If you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing, just always use this config.update method and then it will work. Um, or you can also disable the templating mechanism because that's actually why it goes wrong in the background. If you all, always do operations with templating disabled, then it will also work as expected. So if you do this the wrong way, um, nothing will crash or go wrong, but the readme file will not be copied when you try it like this. And that's, I guess, a bit hard to debug or, or difficult to figure out why, why it's wrong, but it, it will just not work. So that's an important detail to be aware of when, when using hooks. Any questions on the use of hooks? This is a very powerful feature and you can go a long way with this, but of course you have to be a bit careful. Okay, so there's no questions, I'll continue. Um, with submitting installations as slurm jobs. So this is also a very interesting feature. I have something on the slides on this. Um, so here we have to be a little bit more careful when setting up the environment on Putty next to using the central software stack and loading EasyBuild as a module. Um, we have to change things a little bit in the, in the easy build configuration. So we still use our home directory for sources, software modules. Um, for the build part, we're actually going to change it to RAM disk, so to dev mem, uh, because the default location slash temp user is only very small on, on worker nodes. Um, and dev mem is, has gigabytes of space, and that's enough for the, the examples that we will do. Uh, I'll explain later why this is important. Um, and we also have to change the job backend. We have to tell EasyBuild to use Slurm as a job backend. By default, it uses a different library, GC3Py, which is not available on, on Putty, I think, which will certainly not work because you have to configure it. Um, but this was has been the default for a while. And since then, we've also added support in EasyBuild to talk directly to Slurm. Um, whenever EasyBuild submits, an installation as a job, it basically runs an sbatch command. And on Putty specifically, we have to make sure that's done to the right uh, Slurm account. So you also have to run, set this environment variable uh, to make sure that's done correctly. So especially the last one, you will not see um, in the tutorial itself because that is very specific to Putty. We'll make sure um, you have this properly set. So I'll just copy paste all of these. 
and start with a new session so I have things properly set up. So this one is very important on Putin uh, to make sure things are working correctly. So what are we doing here? Um, rather than just installing things on whatever node we are logged into, in this case, the login node, we want to farm out, we want to distribute installations to a cluster. Um, this is very useful when you're doing lots of installations. For example, um, when you have a new cluster or if you want to reinstall all your software after doing an OS update um, and you have an empty cluster sitting there anyway, you might as well use it to do the installations. How does this work? Um, Easy Build has a dash dash job option, um, which changes the default behavior of doing the installation locally. Instead, it will create a job script, submit that job script to the job backend, in this case, Slurm, and then the actual installation will happen in the job. So important here is to do the configuration first. Um, so whenever you use eb-job, the full easy build configuration will be sent into the job script. So Slurm sort of does that by default, at least for the environment. Easy build does the same thing, but it will take its whole configuration the way it was configured when eb-job was used, and it will make sure that the job uses that same exact configuration. Um, that means that even easy build configuration files or easy build environment variables that are set when doing the job submission will also go into the job. Even when these configuration files are not in the job environment, that configuration will still apply. Same for environment variables. You don't have to have these set in the job environment because easy build will uh, copy the whole configuration. What it basically does is it translates all the configuration options to command line options and it will generate one long EB command um, to make sure that things are properly configured. So that's important to know whatever configuration you have active at the time you run EB dash dash job, that will also happen in the job script. Um, so we have to make sure that we use Slurm as a job backend. So make sure that EasyBuild is configured to do so. That's one of the environments variables we're setting here. Um, and then it basically boils down to just running eb dash dash job. So running your regular eb command with the name of an easy config file and adding that dash dash job to it will make it generate the job script and do the job submission. By default, easy build will submit a single core job requesting 24 hours of wall time. Uh, whether that's a good default, I'm not sure, uh, but it sort of makes sense, I guess. Um, and of course, you're probably not happy with this. Um, so you can change the number of cores it asks for with the job course configuration option. You can change the wall time it's asking for with job, job max wall time. And usually you use these on the command line. You can add them in an easy build uh, environment variable or in the configuration file as well. Um, if you want to change the default, uh, you can certainly do that too. But typically this is the type of command you run um, when submitting installations as jobs. Uh, in the background, EasyBuild will run an sbatch command. So um, if you need to change things in the way that EasyBuild submits the jobs and there's no corresponding um, configuration options for that, at least with Slurm, you can still set sbatch environment variables and those will be picked up automatically when sbatch is run. So for example, to specify an account like we're doing here, we can just set the sbatch account environment variable. And then when easybuild runs sbatch, it will pick that up and it will be happy. Same thing for the partition. If you want to submit to a small or a large or a GPU partition, you can set the corresponding environment variable and those will be picked up. Usually when you do installations via jobs, it's maybe because you have a big installation that takes hours to run and you don't want to do that on the login node, or you have an installation that has lots of dependencies missing and you want to do all those dependencies and jobs as well. Um, EasyBuild handles this in a smart way. If you combine dash dash job and dash dash robot, um, it will not submit a single job, but it will submit a job per installation that needs to be done. Um, and it will also set dependencies between these jobs. So if you're installing something that requires five other things, um, your, your main job will wait until the five others are done correctly and only then will it proceed. 
with just that basic slurm dependencies uh, between these jobs. Uh, so those get handled correctly. And then before we go through an example, some attention points here again to take into account. Um, there may be differences between the, the login nodes that you're working on and the cluster worker nodes. So sometimes on the login node, things are a little bit different compared to a worker node, and you have to be a little bit careful there because again, the easy build configuration that is active when doing the submission will be copied onto the worker node. So maybe the configuration that you have to do on a login node is a bit different from what you have to do on a worker node. And one specific example of that is the build path. So that's why we're setting this one to dash mem rather than slash temp. Uh, because on, on the putty worker nodes, slash temp is very small. It's only 100 megabytes, I think. And it does give you a, a separate directory where you can run into, which where you have more space. That's a little bit harder to configure in easy build unless you use hooks, I guess. Um, but an alternative is just using dash mem where we easily have gigabytes of uh, RAM disk space available. So we just use this one rather than slash temp. So, and the, the main reason we do this is because we need to do it when running installations as jobs on a worker node. So here, for example, as well on the login node, we're running slash temp and we're happy with that. But when we're doing the job submission, we change this to, in this case, slash local disk, because we know using slash temp on the worker nodes is not going to work. And when we use slash local disk, it will be happy. So you, you can do it like this in the environment, like I'm doing here, or only when running the job option, you can change the configuration on the fly, and this will be copied into the jobs that are submitted. So that's important. You may run into broken installations there if you're not careful. Another um, issue or certainly something to take into account is the, the temporary log files that EasyBuild creates and also the build directories. Um, so EasyBuild will generate a log file in slash temp um, where it keeps track of what's going on in the installation. And if the installation fails, you can check the log file and figure out what went wrong. When you submit installations as jobs, those log files will be local on the worker nodes. As soon as the job completes, usually the temp directory is cleaned up and you will lose the log file. So that's annoying. Um, you can fix this in two ways. There's probably other ways as well, but two ways that um, are easy to do. You can change the location of the temporary log files with uh, an easy build configuration option. So in running eb job, you can tell it, okay, those temporary log files, put them in my home directory because if something fails, I want to be able to check them afterwards. Um, if the installation completes successfully, the log file will be cleaned up automatically. So you don't have to worry about this becoming too big. But if the installation fails, um, the log file will be kept there. Um, so it won't be cleaned up uh, like it is when in slash temp. So that's useful. Another option is to use log to standard out. Um, which is absolutely horrible if you use it in a, in a regular setting. So log to standard out just spits out oh, load easy build. Um, this is pretty horrible if you use it in a regular installation uh, because you'll see the full log file scrolling to your terminal. And this is probably not very useful. But when you're running installations as jobs, this can be useful because then you at least get the log file itself and the job output file. That could be interesting. Of course, those output files may are going to pile up and they will be uh, fairly big, maybe even several megabytes. So you want to be careful with that, that you're not filling up your home directory that way. But at least it's an option as well to um, get the, the log file for the full installation um, and the able to inspect it when it fails. The same applies to build directories, but there it's a little bit more difficult. So if an installation fails and you're using slash temp as a build directory, that will be cleaned up automatically when the job fails and you'll lose all that uh, information. So you won't be able to inspect things again. Um, that's a bit more difficult to handle because you if you want to do a build directory on a shared file system, you have to be very careful. Like we've seen with on Luster, that doesn't really seem to work. Um, on GPFS, it, it's okay usually, 
Um, and that probably depends on, on how the file system is configured as well. Um, so that's a bit, this is a bit more difficult to, to deal with. One option there is when you see the installation failing, you just redo it either on the login node or you start an interactive job and you do redo the installation there. If you really need to inspect the build directory, uh, you can still do it like this, of course. So that's maybe a small downside of running installations as jobs when the installation fails. And then here also a small um, uh, side note to mention, since a couple of versions, easy build create locks fi lock files when starting an installation to make sure that the same installation is not being run twice on two different systems and then they step on each other's toes and both installations fail. So easy build creates a lock file whenever you start the same installation again somewhere else it will hit the log file, it will stop there, um, and it won't actually start the second installation. Um, when an installation fails, that log file is cleaned up automatically. If you cancel an installation manually with Control C, EasyBuild kicks in in time and also cleans up the log file, so that's fine. But when an installation runs in a Slurm job and the Slurm job gets canceled, either manually with S cancel or because it runs out of wall time, um, that log file is typically not cleaned up. And this is sort of a bug in EasyBuild, but it's not that easy to fix because when a job is canceled in Slurm, apparently it doesn't send the signal that um, the job receives down to the job steps. And since EasyBuild is running in one of these jo job steps, it never sees that it's being canceled and it can't clean up the, the log file as far as I know. That's a bit annoying if, if you submit an installation as a job, and the job gets canceled, that log file will stay there. And if you try, retry the installation, uh, you will hit the log file and it will abort um, instantly. Um, to work around this, you either clean up the log file so that the log file is in the software.logs subdirectory, um, or you tell EasyBuild to just ignore logs, which is probably not the, the best thing to do, but uh, at least that's an easy workaround um, to try. Okay, so keep that in mind. You may see log files, um, especially if you're canceling jobs or if you have failing jobs. Um, so don't be surprised if you see that popping up. Okay, let's then look at a concrete example. Um, so make sure EasyBuild is properly configured. That should be already done here in this session. Let's just inspect the configuration. We're using Dev Shmem as a build path, that's important because that's because slash temple not work on the worker nodes. We're using Slurm as a job backend, so that looks okay. And for everything else, we're using our home directory. And also very important, we uh, yeah, easy build is loaded and we do have the central software stack available here. So all these modules are visible to easy build. So that looks okay. This is set up. We have easy build loaded. We have the S batch account one set up correctly to our uh, project here on Putty. So that looks okay. So we're ready to start submitting jobs. Um, let's try this for this Augustus um, software package. So this is something that needs a whole bunch of dependencies. Let's check what's still missing here. Um, Probably, yeah, this should match so a whole bunch of things. Boost is missing, a couple of bioinformatics tools, sweet sparse, which will take a while to install and so on. Um, so that's that looks like a lot of work to do on the login node. So let's try doing this in parallel across different worker nodes. Um, what we'll do here is we'll do the installation, but we'll use dash dash job. We'll tell EasyBuild to use 10 cores and one hour of wall time, that should be enough. So the one hour is for each installation separately. So as the jobs, uh, the, the course is 10 cores per installation job. Uh, we'll do robots to make sure all the dependencies are taken care of as well. And we'll also enable dash dash trace so we get some meaningful um, job output files that at least show which commands were being run in the jobs. Let me run this one first because this will take a while to complete the whole thing. So now EasyBuild will check which dependencies are missing and it will it should submit 11 jobs. 
uh, one for the 10 dependencies and then one for Augustus itself. And you see before it's doing that, it's making sure that all the source files are in place. So if it has any missing sources, it will download these first on the login node, and then it will only go ahead and um, submit the installation job. So it takes into account that the worker nodes may not have access to the internet, or at the, at the very least, it tries to make sure that the sources are available first before it submits the, the jobs, uh, because there's little point in, in submitting jobs if the source files are not gonna be there. When it's done downloading all these things, it will submit 11 jobs. And then we can check with the slurm command, with the sq command rather, um, how these jobs look like. So this is taking a little bit to download all those files. Hopefully that will complete. And here, I guess I can already uh, explain the output. So if we, EasyBuild has su submitted all those jobs, it will set dependencies between them as needed. So most of the jobs can run each in their, can start straight away because they ha don't have any required dependencies that are missing. Augustus itself, of course, has to wait until all the others are done. And apparently also BCF tools and sweet parse have to wait until one of the dependencies um, is in place. So now we can check with SQ what is submitted. Um, and it seems we were a bit greedy with the 10 cores and all of these are still pending. So of course we're at the mercy of the Slurm queue, um, whether these will start or not, but at least they're, they're nicely waiting in the queue. And we do see the dependencies being set for BCF tools, Sweet Sparse and Augustus itself. So eventually these will start running and we'll see the installations pop up. We'll just let that sit there. We won't wait for that. Uh, when all the jobs complete and you check the modules that were installed in your home directory, um, you should see 11 additional modules, one for each of the dependencies um, and then one for Augustus itself. And then of course you can check that Augustus is there and start using it. So already with 11 installations that may be worth doing that, uh, at least if the queue has a bit of space, um, but this is, for example, what we do when we're testing easy builds. Uh, we run a regression test that where we install as much or reinstall as much software as possible in a, in a sandbox. And that involves often 10,000 installations. And basically what we do is we run a single EB command with just as job, that's just robot enabled, and it submits all those installations into a Slurm queue. And then after a couple of, after a day or two, uh, we check the result and we inspect what went wrong. Any questions on this job submission feature? Yeah, I have one. Is sure. there a way to also automatically clean the build path? Because on some clusters, you may be building on a uh, file system that's not cleaned automatically at the end of the job. Um, well, when, when the installation finishes correctly, the build path will be cleaned up automatically. Sure, but you also the have to take into account that the job might fail. Yeah, so for, for that, um, I don't think we have something in EasyBuild itself. Uh, we'd have to check because there's lots of configuration files or configuration options. No, I don't think we have something that, that cleans up, that always cleans up the build, the build directory. So this this could be a configuration option that we add, eh? First, um, even if it's yeah, easy. It might be a nice sale. one, actually. I don't know whether we will need it on Lumi or not, but uh, on Lumi we may have other problems. That that's pretty easy to implement when, mm -hmm. when EasyBuild sees a failing installation and now it just doesn't touch the build directory, but you could force it to, of course. Uh, I guess it might even be possible to do it in a hook. Uh, yeah. So the end hook, for example. Um, you would, do, 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 yeah, in the end hook, it will work. You could, you could check um, how easy build was configured. So which build path it is using and just clean out that whole build path. Um, yeah, you have to be a little bit careful, I guess, if that build path is a shared directory between different installations on the same node, or if it's on the shared file system, then you don't want to clean up the whole build, build path, of course, only the ones that you, you touched. Uh, but yeah, if you're smart enough, you can probably do it in the hook. Yeah. 
Unless, of course, end hook would not be called if a job fails. Invisibility. Uh, no, it, it is. It's always called. Okay. Even when uh, even when the job fails, um, the end hook is always called. I, I think on our clusters we, we have something that uh, users can uh, de de define something that is uh, executed at the end of the job in the I think job epilogue script or so. Mm -hmm. uh, that could also be a means. So for example, easy build could just fail for whatever reason, and then maybe whatever you would define in the end hook may not be executed. Yeah, if there's a hard crash somewhere in the middle, then yeah, the end hook will not be triggered. So that's true. But if, if it's just a failing installation, then easy build will still trigger the end hook. Yeah. There's certainly scenarios where the end hook will, will not be triggered. That's true. Okay. Any other questions on this? There is a question we'll... in the chat. Yeah, so we can use the coffee break and wait until this is completed, but it's actually, it's going. Okay, so... Some of the installations are done. So I would like, I just ask the question on the chat. Uh, it is the question about because you are using uh, uh, this shared memory for uh, for temporary di directory, and mm -hmm. in fact we are using some kind of RAM disk, which is which is just uh, at the start of the job we could create the variable let's say memfs and uh, could we just uh, give it to the slurm config uh, to the easy build config uh, for the temporary uh, as a temporary directory for builds or we have to um, some, yeah you know i'm talking so, about so right uh, now the variable which is not accessible at the at the login node when you are mm -hmm. creating the environment but only in inside the slurm job yeah, yeah, I understand. So the, right now, the configuration that is done is is static. Um, so you, you do dash mem dollar user, and that's just copied um, into the job. If you need something more dynamic, like for example, using an environment variable that is set only in the job, um, for this for this type of thing, you need to use a start hook, um, where, where you tell EasyBuild, look in this okay. environment right after EasyBuild has started, you check the value of this environment variable, okay. and then you do yeah, some. Yeah something right, with it right right um, well, one thing that's a little bit difficult to do right now but it's something we're we're going to fix quite soon i think is once easy build has started it's fairly difficult to change the configuration when it's already running that's something we will fix um, but what you can do now in a start hook if you're for example have local fs defined as an environment variable you could create a sim link to whatever location easy build is using so you could say slash temp slash user, easy build, please use that as a build path. Okay. And then in the start hook, you could create a sim link um, to the right location and then easy build will just use that uh, and, and be happy. Um, so that, okay, that's thanks. a trick you can already do. Yeah, yeah And ho hopefully soon we will allow you to reconfigure easy build while it's already running. Um, okay. And then you can more easily do it in the start hook. Great idea, thanks. So jobs are still going. On Putty, it's almost done. I'll just let it sit there. Um, let's look at module naming schemes. Um, so this is an important aspect as well of Easy Build, where you basically define the user interface, so how people will be accessing the software that is installed with Easy Build. Um, the way the modules are named, so how what module name will be used for an Easy Config file like this, for example, is determined by the module naming scheme. By default, EasyBuild uses its default module naming scheme, um, which is very close to how easy config files are named. So software name slash version dash toolchain, and then maybe a version suffix at the end. Um, you may or may, you may not be happy with that, and you may want to change it. And there's various ways of doing that. Um, next to the standard, Easy build module naming scheme. There's a couple of other naming schemes that are included with Easy build itself. And you can check what those are with the avail module naming schemes command line option. Uh, a particular one we'll be looking at today um, is the hierarchical module naming scheme. And I'll explain what that means <clears throat> in a bit. And we'll also. Um, look into implementing our own custom module naming scheme. So one that's not included with EasyBuild and how you can use that. 
So let's first look at the hierarchical module naming scheme, what that means. So that's a, a very different way of organizing the modules. Um, so the standard module naming scheme, we call a flat module naming scheme um, because yeah, everything is basically flat. You always see all the modules uh, when you do a module avail and um, the names are of the modules are enough to identify a specific installation. So just by the name of the module file, you know uh, which installation it's referring to. This has a couple of downsides, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, with a hierarchical module naming scheme, you organize uh, the module files in a different way. You have different levels of module files, so they're, they form a hierarchy. Um, and that has a couple of advantages. It also has some slight disadvantages. Um, the, the typical module hierarchy has three levels which are also shown in the figure here. There's a core level. So this is anything that was installed <clears throat> with a system tool chain. So anything that doesn't use a compiler controlled by EasyBuild um, goes into this top level, the core level. For, ex so for example, GCC itself, which we install with EasyBuild, but is built, is compiled using the system compiler, um, goes into this core level. Um, then below the core level, we have the compiler level. So anything that was installed with a compiler only toolchain provided by EasyBuild goes in here. And then in the MPI level, we have stuff that depends on both a compiler and an MPI library that are both controlled with EasyBuild. You can define the module hierarchy with as many levels as you want to, or totally different levels compared to these. That's entirely up to you. Um, but this hierarchy is also what the standard uh, hierarchical module naming scheme that comes with easy build um, implements. So how does this work? Um, when you have a module hierarchy, at, at first you only see the modules that are on top of the hierarchy. So you see only the core modules. In this case, only a compiler. Um, in this case, we only have a single one. Um, so if you run module avail, you'll only see this GCC module, you won't see anything else. To get access to the other software that is installed, you first have to load one of these core compilers. Um, and this is not an official term, but I call these gateway modules. So whenever you load a module like this, and you then run module avail again, you will see a bunch of addition, additional modules appearing. Whenever you load a compiler, you also you make the modules that are built with that compiler available for loading as well. So first you run module avail, you load GCC, uh, you run module avail again, and you'll see both these MPI uh, modules ready for loading as well. And then when you pick one of these mod MPI modules and you load it, for example, you load OpenMPI, then you make additional software available that was built with both this MPI and this compiler, for example, F50W or HDL5. I will see a hands-on example of that in, at the end of this section, how that works um, exactly. So this is also described here at, at length in the text. Um, so a couple of things that are typical for a module hierarchy. So not all the module files are directly available for loading. Um, if you do module avail, you'll see only a limited set of them. And you need to load some of these gateway modules to get access to additional modules. Um, before you can load maybe the software that you're after. So, so why go through this trouble? Um, this has a couple of advantages. So first of all, you have shorter module names because the, the tool chain with which a module was, was built is sort of encoded in the location where it is put. So uh, this is actually the full module names that you see here. So open API slash version, that, that's all there is to it. You don't have to encode the tool, the tool chain that was used in the module name because that's already implied. You can only actually see this module when the corresponding compiler toolchain is already loaded. So there's no point in mentioning that again in the module name. Same here for HDF5. This is the full module name for HDF5 because uh, just by the way you, you access it, um, you know which MPI and which compiler this was built. So you have very short module names, that's, that's nice. Um, you also see less modules at the time. Um, so module avail is a lot less overwhelming. Um, and you see less modules because first of all, you have 
fewer modules available when you when you start from scratch you only see the core modules but also when loading additional modules and loading gateway modules um, in this case uh, five out of six modules will be available um, as soon as you have gcc and open api loaded mpage will not be but in a real software stack this is these branches are a lot bigger um, and you may have a thousand modules but at any single point you may only have 200 modules visible in module avail for example so it helps a lot in keeping overview of modules um, and all the modules that you see in the module avail output are compatible with each other they are built with the same compiler tool chain built with the same mpi so you can use them together um, and combine these tools that were built with uh, the same tool chain in the same session of course that depends a bit on how the how the module hierarchy was organized as well you still could get conflicts depending on uh, Python version, for example, which is not a part of the module hierarchy, but uh, it could be if you wanted to. There's also minor disadvantages um, in using a module hierarchy. So one of the advantages is that the, the overview of available modules is less overwhelming. The disadvantage is that not everything is directly visible. So if people only use module avail, they will not see everything that's available. So that's a bit annoying, but there's a, there's a workaround for that. Um, and these gateway modules, so having having to load a compiler and an API first, can maybe be a bit annoying to end users. So why do they have to care about a compiler if all what they care about is their bioinformatics tool? And maybe they don't, they don't even know what a compiler is. Uh, so all of these things are explained here in the sections as well. I think I covered all of them. So short module names, you don't see all the modules and that's both the a good and a bad thing. Um, you can only load compatible modules together, at least in terms of compiler and MPI. Um, you don't see all the modules in a hierarchy with module avail, but a tool like LMOD is very much aware of organizing modules in a hierarchy and has a separate subcommand for that module spider. So at module spider, you can look for software no matter where it's located in the, in the hierarchy and no matter whether you can load it already or not. Um, Elmot will always tell you whether the software is, is there somewhere or if it's totally missing. And we'll see that in the example as well. And then these gateway modules, yeah, depending on how, how experienced their users are, they may or may not have um, meaning to them and they may get annoyed if they have to load other stuff before getting access to the software they're interested in. We'll get back to an, a detailed example of using a module hierarchy. Uh, at the end, but first let's look at how to implement a custom module naming scheme. So something that's not included with EasyBuild itself. How do you write your own? Um, to come up with your own module naming scheme, first of all, you have to be have to do a bit of thinking because it, it may seem straightforward to do so, but you have to make sure that the module names are unique. So whenever you do an installation that you don't get a, a clash in, in module names for two different installations. Um, and especially when designing a module hierarchy, you have to be very careful what you do uh, to do this well. So the very basics of it to use your own custom module naming scheme is that you implement a small Python module file, um, which defines a class that derives from the module naming scheme class, which is part of the EasyBuild API. And in this class, you have to at least implement this determined full module name method, which takes an easy config file and returns a string that represents the module name. So that's the very uh, minimal thing you have to do. Depending on how you define your module naming scheme, you may have to also implement this additional method, which does a check between the module name and the software name. So it checks whether the module name that it, it gives you, or that you get, and the software name that you get, whether there's a match between those. Um, and if you, yeah, this has a default implementation, but that may not match what you do in your module naming scheme. So you may have to change this as well. And I'll show an example of that. Um, and the argument you get to this method um, can either be a full easy config instance, so a fully parsed easy config file, and then you have all the easy config parameters, or it can be a small Python dictionary that only provides these four 
um, easy config parameters. That's because when, whenever you specify something as a dependency in an easy config file name, this is all the information you get. And as long as that's enough to determine the module name, then EasyBuild doesn't have to go uh, and look for easy config files, parse them um, to determine the module names for all the dependencies. Um, so it's it's better if you stick to just these four. But if you if you need additional um, easy config parameters, you can tell EasyBuild that your module name needs more than just these four, and then EasyBuild will make sure to always give you an easy config um, instance whenever uh, determining a module name. And which um, easy config parameters you need, you can specify via this class constant required keys. So that's all. That all sounds a bit abstract. Um, there's more details when defining a module hierarchy, of course. Um, this determined full module name is not enough. Uh, you have to basically design your, your different levels and control which modules go in which level. Um, also how the, the, the levels are named. Um, all of this you have to define yourself when defining a module, a, hier a hierarchical module naming scheme. Um, the standard example of that is the one we include with EasyBuild. This looks very complex uh, because it takes into account lots of different tool chains and combinations of things. And it tries to come up with the proper naming um, for all of them. So that looks a bit, a bit complex, but you see things here like the required keys. So when with the hierarchical module naming scheme, it needs name, version, suffix, and toolchain. It also needs module class because that's how it distinguishes between a compiler and MPI and something else. So this is how it determines the different levels, for example. Um, and next to determining the full module name, uh, which in a hierarchy looks something like this. So the name of the level and then the name of the module or the name of the level and the name of the module. So the full module name also includes the location in the hierarchy where it's located. And then the short module name is the user facing thing. So you have to tell EasyBuild both how to determine the full module name, how to determine the short module name. Um, this one I'll skip, but also here you need to figure out um, what the name of the directory is where the module file should be located. So all these things you have to specify. And that it's certainly a lot more tricky for a module hierarchy than it is for a flat uh, naming scheme. Once you've done all that work, and we will show a quick example of how to do that, uh, you have to configure EasyBuild to actually use your naming scheme. And for that, you have to do two things. First, you have to include um, your Python module via include module naming schemes, so either as an environment variable or in the configuration file or whatever. Um, and then you also have to tell EasyBuild that this is the active module naming scheme. So you both have to include the Python module and tell EasyBuild that this is the one you want to use. So let's try doing that with this example. So this is an, an implementation of a custom module naming scheme, which is relatively short. Um, it's, it looks a bit weird. I would never use this in production, but it gives you a good idea. So what we do here is we name, uh, we use software slash um, version tool chain. So very similar to what EasyBuild does by default. So here's an example, uh, but we do a couple of things. We do everything lowercase. Um, we don't like dash characters, so we replace them with underscores. And we also put the version suffix directly after the version. So not at the end of the module name, but directly after the version. So if there's a sub, uh, version suffix, it would go here before the tool chain. Whoever wrote this likes this better and that's their good right to do it like this. Um, and to make easy build name modules like this, you implement this small Python module, which derives from the module naming scheme class. And you define two methods in this case, the determine full module name. So this produces a string um, that gives you the full module name. So it takes the version, it adds the suffix if it's not empty. It adds the tool chain except for system tool chain. Then we don't add any tool chain part. And then it makes sure that there's no dashes, only underscores, and it avoids double underscores in the module name as well. And we do everything lowercase. Uh, mainly because of this lowercase thing and also replacing dashes, 
we also have to implement this additional method which checks whether uh, this module name is a module for this software and yeah that's a very easy check we just check whether the module name starts with the name of the software where the name is lowercase and the dashes are replaced with underscores if that's the case we return true if that's not the case we return false and that's how easy we'll make sure that the module names are uh, correct for the software it's trying to install so let's try using this let me check my environment again this looks okay uh, so let's do example mns.py just copy paste this in a python module we configure easy build to use it so let's use environment variables for that and do example mns.py so if we now check avail module naming schemes we should already see it popping up this one example mns so now easy build knows about the naming scheme but it's not using it yet to make it also use it um, and we can check that if we do show full config module naming scheme yeah so by default it uses the easy build module naming scheme if we also define this environment variable then easy build will switch to the example module naming scheme that we're defining here and now to check what things look like um, we have an example yes we can do a dry run um, it's not happy with that okay well i'm not sure why it's not finding this easy config file um but if we do a dry run and here i'm just using the python 3 scipy bundle so without this version suffix um the dry run output will show us all the module names what things will look like so here you can expect and inspect whether the module naming scheme you have in mind is actually fully working um, and produces what you expect it to produce and then of course when you actually do installations it will also use these module names uh, when creating module files so let's now look at the example of a module hierarchy so a more complex um, alternative module naming scheme um, we'll, I'll do a demo of that here. There's a couple of important things to take into account um, on Putty. So one thing you have to avoid when playing with different module naming schemes is that you mix modules that, was, that were installed with different naming schemes because you, in some cases, a module may be named the same um, in two different naming schemes, but if it accidentally picks up one from a different naming scheme, um, the, the contents of the modules may actually be different in terms of what they do. So to avoid the trouble here, um, let me see if I have it here as well. Yeah, uh, We will start from a fully clean environment. So we will do a module purge to unload all loaded modules, and we will fully hide all the modules in the, in the current module path. Um, so we, we won't actually do the module use to pick up the central software stack, um, at least not at this point. Um, so what we want is an empty module path like this, and we, want, we don't want to have any modules loaded at all. So that's mainly to protect ourselves from running into weird situations where we're mixing things um, with different module naming schemes. Now, we, we do have one problem. We can't load EasyBuild anymore as a module. Um, there's ways around that. You can install easy build in a hierarchy, but it's a bit tricky to do that. Um, at least at first, when you don't have easy build yet. So to work around that here, we'll just do a pip install dash dash user. So we'll install easy build in our home directory, uh, make sure the path is updated and we'll tell easy build to use Python 3 because we're installing it with pip 3. So if you just copy paste this on putty, this should give you a oh, ah it's not happy when i copy paste it from the slide let's do it one by one like this do the installation i think i have it here as well yeah 
you copy paste it from here, it should be better. You won't have the problem I have on the slides. Um, so that's important. Make sure you have a clean environment. Make sure you have an easy build installation you can use without having a module installed. Um, so this is the, the easiest way to do that. So it gets installed into .local. This takes a little while. Um, once the installation is done, we have a, a working easy build version. Um, we'll also configure easy build. So the usual um, install software in our home directory, or at least define the prefix to use our home directory. Uh, the build path to use slash temp, we're playing on the login node, so that, that should work. Um, we'll use the hardcore module naming scheme in this exercise. And here we do something a little bit special. So usually the software directory is in the prefix, the modules directory is in there as well. We're changing that. We want to use the centrally installed software um, here, so the existing software installations, but we're, we're gonna put the module somewhere else. We're gonna put the modules in our home directory. So what we're doing is we're creating a new view on existing installations. We're not gonna reinstall any software. We're just gonna generate module files for existing installations. Okay, so this pip3 is done. Let me make sure my environment is properly set up so it finds the eb command, that looks okay. Um, I'll do this as well, but I'll use the version from the slides here. So this I already did, module purge, module unuse, I already did. These other ones here are important. There's one that's different, that's this one because our central software stack is somewhere else. So make sure you use the correct one here. This is the only different one. So what I'll do is I'll copy all of these and then take this different one from the slides. And I hope the formatting is not messed up. Yeah, be careful. You don't get any extra spaces. <clears throat> if you do a show config, it should look something like this. Um, the important one here is the location of the software that should point to the existing directory in our um, project space. Uh, we want to use hierarchical module naming scheme and we want to park the modules that EasyBuild will generate in our home directory, but in a separate HMNS subdirectory. So we don't have any clashes with existing modules. So be a bit careful with the configuration. That's quite important in this exercise. Uh, all of this, I think I mentioned. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to um, set up a module hierarchy for HDF5, which is uh, already installed in here. So the installation is already there. We're not gonna install the software itself. That would take a bit too long because it has to do with the tool chain, GCC, Open API as well. Uh, but we already have all the installations. We'll use this easy config file. We'll use dash dash robot. So we also get modules for all the dependencies. And we will use module only, which tells easy build skip the entire installation process, only generate the module files. And easy build will generate the module file as long as the sanity check passes. So it will still run the sanity check. Try, that means it will try to load the module file and uh, check for files and sometimes run a couple of simple commands. And only if the sanity check passes, will it actually go ahead and create the module. So if we do this, and remember EasyBuild has been configured to use a hierarchy, um, it should generate modules for, ah, it's already there, didn't clean this up. There is again. Um, it will generate modules one by one, starting with the tool chain and all the dependencies in there. Um, and at the end, it should have generated 41 modules in a module hierarchy, and we can check what that looks like. <clears throat> this will take two, two or three minutes, so I'll, I'll continue um, explaining things a bit, and then I'll show it hands-on as well. So after a couple of minutes, we'll have 41 modules in um, our HMNS directory here which are organized in a hierarchy. And then when we start inspecting things, we will see um, when we just do an LS in the modules all subdirectory, we will see our three levels, the core level, which is the top one, 
the compiler level, which has installations which were done with the compiler toolchain. Um, and then the MPI level, which has basically everything that was done with the compiler plus MPI toolchain. So this is where HDF5 will be located. To start things off, we have to set up our model path. And we start from the top of the hierarchy. So not modules all, but the core directory in there. So remember, uh, the module files in here will be core slash GCC slash version. Um, but the user facing module names are the short ones, which don't include the core. So that means the core subdirectory has to be part of the module path. If you do this module use, and then you check with module avail, you, sh you should see output like this, where in the core directory, we have a bunch of modules. All of these are installed with the system tool chain. And the one we're really interested in is our compiler tool chain, GCC. Everything else is either a dependency for this one or a build dependency, so something that was needed to just get uh, this GCC installation in place. So the nice thing here, everything is very nice and short, short module names, software slash version that looks very clean, but we only have a limited set of software available. There's no sign of HDF5 here yet. There's no sign of an MPI here uh, either. Uh, if we check with module avail, HDF5, uh, Elmod will say, oh, sorry, I don't know about this module. It doesn't seem to be there. Um, at least it says it's not available for loading straight away. If you do a module spider HDF5, Elmod will tell you, okay, I found HDF5, but it's a bit hidden right now. You have to make sure that these two modules are loaded before HDF5 is available for loading. So Elmod is aware of the module hierarchy. It knows about this GCC gateway module and it knows about the open API gateway module, and it knows that both of those are have to be loaded to be able to access HDF5. So then we can start doing that. We load the GCC module, we check module avail again, and we see a bunch of additional modules. So these were here before the core modules. We've opened up another level. It looks like two levels, but that's a, that's a detail in how we organize tool chains in, in EasyBuild. Uh, has a GCC level and a GCC core level. They're basically uh, the same level, just split across different directories, but that's a detail. Um, so this, this is a bunch of things installed with this GCC version. Um, and we have an open API module available as well. Okay, meanwhile has, has completed the module files. So let's start setting this up. So in here, we have the three levels, core, compiler, and MPI. To start things off, I should do a module use on the core directory, so the top of the hierarchy. And then when using module avail, we see nice and short module names that include everything on the core level. Our gateway model is this one, so we just load this. Um, and that both makes GCC available. Uh, and it also opens up another level in the hierarchy. So when we run module avail again, we see a bunch more stuff where some of these things are already loaded. Uh, the next one we're interested in is our open API gateway module, which we can also load and then check module avail again. Uh, so we check module avail after loading GCC we load the next gateway module, OpenMPI, we check again, and then we see our HDF5 available. So now this one depends on both a compiler and an MPI, and specifically on these versions. Uh, and now we can load this HDF5 10.7, and then start using it, for example, this dump tool. So now HDF5 is fully active. The, when we check module list, it's all nice and clean, very short and clean module names. Um, so this is a lot more user-friendly. And in addition, um, only some of the modules are available. There may be other stuff installed in this hierarchy. In this case, there's not, but there, there could be. And they, they won't be visible up, on the, up to this point because anything that was installed with a different GCC version is in theory at least not compatible with what is being uh, loaded here. 
So if you want to use a different compiler or a different MPI, we have to swap over to another part of the module hierarchy. So for the people who want to, can run an exercise like this themselves with SciPy bundle and basically go through the same steps like I did for HDF5. Yeah, the question? Uh, Kenneth, may, may I still ask you to, uh, to, to, this, to explain a little bit more what is the reason to, let's say, group these modules into the GCC and GCC core uh, directories? You said yeah. that this is only deta detail, but this is always confusing for me. Yeah, I understand. Sure. Um, let's see. So the, the reason we do this is because these installations in here, most of these are either build dependencies for something or something where performance doesn't matter too much. So they're not very performance sensitive, at least in, the, in terms of how they are compiled. Um, when we put something here, um, so with the GCC tool chain, this is where we put stuff that's more sensitive in terms of how it is compiled. And because we're only using GCC here, it, it's a bit difficult to see, but whenever we install something with Intel compilers as well, um, performance sensitive stuff would go in here and maybe compiled with an Intel compiler as well. So Intel compiler or PGI or something else. While these um, are always available no matter which compiler is used because GCC core is what we call a, a sub tool chain. And even when using Intel or any other compiler, we always control the GCC that sits underneath as well. We, we don't want to rely on the GCC of the operating system. So when using an Intel tool chain, all of these are considered as dependencies. So you probably don't care how Bison is, is compiled or uh, how package config is compiled. For UCX here, we make the assumption that um, you see, building UCX with the Intel compiler probably doesn't make a lot of sense. You, you won't see any big performance speedups. While for OpenMPI itself, because especially that uses things like AVX2 instructions, uh, you have to be a bit more careful and there it does make sense with, uh, to compile it with uh, not GCC, but something else. So in summary, this is mostly relevant when you look at different compiler tool chains, for example, Intel. When using Intel, all of these will be considered. So you don't have to reinstall these with Intel. Um, but as soon as you hit this level of the hierarchy, these will be reinstalled with an Intel compiler because that's where performance really starts mattering. And that's why we have the split between GCC core, which is a, a compiler that we use underneath and then a GCC versus Intel versus other stuff that uses GCC core, but builds up from there. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Now it's clear. So in, in the other words, may I think of, 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 of this split as, a, as my target modules only uh, go, uh, go to the GCC and the GCC core only consists of some, uh, let's say, uh, auxiliaries that are needed, but, but not interesting for me. Yes? Yeah, so yeah, so a lot of these are indeed probably not interesting to an end user as well. That's true. UCX, that's I guess up for discussion. That's of course a very relevant library for for MPI. But the, the main thing you care about is the MPI itself. And UCX is just a supporting library for MPI. So you could even say that these things don't have to be visible to the end user. And there's also ways that you, you can do that, especially in LMOD itself. Then you can say, for example, everything that's in here. I want to hide and the user never has to see this. And there's there's easy ways of doing that. I guess also here, except for maybe the compiler, most of the stuff in here is just supporting um, installations and it's utility modules that you probably don't want to expose to an end user. Thank you. I sometimes make the comparison. I don't know if it's a good one, but like GCC core together with core is like your operating system. On top of which yeah. you build the other software in easy build. Yeah, so this this is indeed sort of the level where typically you you would use a system compiler for this. In easy build, we we don't want to do that because then we're depends which OS you have, which version you have. We like to control the compiler that we use. 
So the very first thing you typically do is you install a GCC version, and then as much as possible, you use that version that you installed with EasyBuild. And as soon as performance starts mattering, that's when you claim, climb up to more specific tool chains uh, like this. The, the GCC one here is actually a combination of this GCC core, which is used for installing these, together with uh, not, the, not this Binny tools, but this one. So the Binny tools built with this GCC version is loaded when you have both of these, uh, when you load the GCC module. And that's why you see this one loaded here and this one loaded here. And this one is a, is a detail. This is actually only used to install this one, but then never used again. So it's like a bootstrapping mechanism. It's a separate from module hierarchies, but of, of course here it becomes very visible uh, because you see things split up into different directories at least. But this is this these two together form the whole compiler level. Right. So now I understand. It's it's quite clever when you when you like to maintain a lot of different uh, tool chains. I I guess. Yeah, it's it's a way to avoid that we get an explosion of easy config files. You don't want to reinstall all of these with every possible compiler. You make a common ground GCC core, and then whenever performance matters, you you take the next step and you go to more specific compilers. Yeah. Okay, any questions on using a module hierarchy? Um, I, I suggest if you're interested in this, try to do this exercise. It's very similar to HDF5 and should be quite quick. Um, but it, it will give you a good feeling of, of uh, the advantages of a module hierarchy and maybe also the disadvantages that you have to pass a compiler and an MPI first before you get to the actual software you're probably interested in. So it's it's a bit of a trade-off whether you want to use this or not. Uchti and Machti actually use a hierarchical module naming scheme for everything which is installed through spec, but not for the mm -hmm. software which is installed through other means. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely don't recommend managing this by hand. That that's a bit insane. So make sure you, you do it in an automated way, whether it's easy build or spec, that that doesn't matter too much. Uh, but don't try to manage this by hand because it's, it's very difficult. There's lots of things you have to take into account to, to get this right. Okay, if there's no more questions. I'll jump to the last bit for today, which is the GitHub integration. Uh, we have an easy build. Um, let me start over. So I have a clean environment again. And here, let's see if I mention it. Yeah, so here it's okay to start again with the uh, the central software we have like this and load easy build as a module. That's okay. Or you can you can keep using the one you installed with pip install um, to play with the module naming scheme that will work as well. At this point, you, you don't really need any software that's already pre-installed for this last part. So let's first look at how to manually contribute something to EasyBuild. So the, the regular contribution procedure where you set up your GitHub account and you run a bunch of Git commands and then click around on GitHub. So how does that work? Um, first of all, you need a GitHub account. So that's hard to avoid. Um, and you also want to register your SSH public key into your account um, to make sure that you can do a Git push into uh, your GitHub account. That's important. Um, you also want to fork the repository you want to contribute to. So in this case, here you go to the central repository and use the fork button on the right. And if you do this, in this case, it's already forked and it jumps straight to the fork I have prepared here with a, a dummy account, an easy build tutorial account. Um, so you want to have something like this, where you have a fork, where it's just forked from the Easy Builders Central Repository. That's important because you will push things in here first before you open the pull request to the central repository. So that's something you always have to do: create a GitHub account, add your SSH pub key, do the clone. Um, from that point on, um, when you have a clone of typically your own. 
So here it's done like this. You clone. Let me see if I already have this here. Yeah, let me move, remove that. This has lots of files, so it, it takes a bit of time to clone it and also clean it up. Um, but I will start with cloning the central Easy Configs repository. You can do it the other way as well, but this is how I like doing it, where this is the, let's say, the main um, source for this Git repository. Um, then you jump into the directory and you add um, your fork as well. And here I just named this my fork. Um, so it's easy to remember. And if you do this yourself, make sure you replace this part with the name of your GitHub account. So don't blindly copy paste this because then it won't work. Um, well, at least that won't, it won't work when you do things manually. So you need to be a bit careful there. So CD into the directory. If you do git remote dash V, our origin points to the central easy builders repository. And for our own fork, in this case, I will use the EB tutorial account. Hit remote add my fork. With remote dash V, you can check that this fork has been added. So say you now want to contribute something. I think I have an example easy config file here from a previous tutorial session. So this is the EB tutorial dummy software package. Um, if I want to make a pull request for this, if you want to do it manually, you start by uh, making sure you're on the develop branch, making sure it's an updated version of the branch and create your own branch, which is named example in this case. Yeah, so we have created a new branch and we've also switched to that branch. Then uh, we need to make sure that we create a directory where the easy config file belongs. Um, we, in this case, copy the example to that location and we give it the right name, tutorial on 101 GCC 10 to zero like this. So with git status, will show us that we're adding a new file, uh, created a new directory with some files in it. Then we want to do git add of this file. Um, so this is now ready to be committed. We create the git commit. I'm complaining here that my config is not fully okay, but that doesn't matter. And then you push the example branch to your fork. So if I do this, that has been pushed. It gives me a handy link to create a pull request. If I go here, GitHub will tell me a new branch has been pushed named example. So this is, if you're a little bit used to it, it's not too complicated, but it's a lot of steps you have to take. A lot of details you have to get right, start from the right branch, put things in the right place, give them the right name and so on. Come up with a good commit message, push, and that's only half the work because then uh, you have to open the pull request. So you click around on GitHub. Um, you make sure you're targeting the right location, the central easy builders repository and the develop branch. Um, come up with a description, make sure things are in the right place, check this again and so on. So it's a bit of a manual um, labor and it's annoying. Um, we, we, have, we actually had many, many people who were interested in contributing uh, but didn't want to go through all this effort or didn't want to take the time to figure it out. Uh, many people were not familiar with Git, um, so that was a bit annoying. So what we did is we um, added features to EasyBuild to make this a lot more simple. To basically avoid that you have to do all these manual steps and you can do it automatically. So how does this work? First of all, you have to do a little bit of additional um, configuration and making sure some requirements are in place. Um, you need two additional Python modules, Git Python. So that's what EasyBuild uses to talk to the Git command and keyring. Um, the keyring one is needed to store 
your GitHub token safely. Um, and in, in this particular case, since we're not on a, on a desktop machine, we also need the script file additional package to make sure we can store the token encrypted. <clears throat> if we try this, try to install this, it will probably go wrong, at least when I did yesterday, um, because uh, the, Python who, the people who developed the cryptography Python module have switched to using Rust. Um, as a compiler, and if you don't have a Rust compiler installed, then you can't install cryptography anymore. They seem to think that's a smart move. Um, you can dance around that by just installing a slightly older version of cryptography as a quick workaround, at least. So that's what I do here, and then redo this one. So you, cryptography is needed for, I think, for keying as a dependency. Um, so if it's there, uh, at least for now, Keering is still happy with a slightly older version of cryptography. So that has all these additional Python packages installed. Um, we also need to make sure you add a GitHub account, a, a GitHub, sorry, an SSH public key to your GitHub account. Um, I have already done that here for this account. If you go to settings and then check SSH keys, and I think this one has a direct link settings slash keys. Uh, you will see I added the public key I have here on Putty into this example uh, GitHub account. This is the key I took from here, id rsh putty.pub. Um, and one additional thing I've done, and I, this is mentioned in the slides, um, I've also symlinked this to the default location. Um, because that's the one that Git will use by default. So my RSA private key here is actually a symlink to the put you one. Uh, so that's the easiest way at least to get things set up here. So that's mentioned here in the slides. Um, add your public key into your GitHub account. And you, you just grab the contents of this file. And for the private key, just make a symlink. So it points to the putty key uh, in the default location. This may actually be a bad idea for other reasons. Uh, so you may want to remove the symlink again, but at least for this exercise, it's, uh, it's useful. The fork I've already showed. Uh, okay, the next step um, is making sure we have a GitHub token. So the GitHub token is used sort of as a password to interact with GitHub automatically. So you don't have to click around. Um, EasyBuild can do it for you. This is in your GitHub account in developer settings, personal access tokens. And again, here, there's a direct link here, settings slash tokens. Uh, you can generate a new token here. I won't do that now because the token is a secret and whoever has the token can access this GitHub account. So it is upfront, uh, but you can generate a new token and make sure it has the gist and the repo um, permissions. When you do that, you can copy paste the token and then give it to EasyBuild. Um, so here we need to make sure EasyBuild is aware of our the name of our GitHub account. In this case, I will use EB tutorial. You should change this to your own GitHub account, of course. And then you can do install GitHub token. And in this case, it should say that I have the token already. Oh, maybe it doesn't. Okay, then I'll. I will need to uh, create one. So let me do that off screen so I don't share it with you. Hold on. So of course the, the GitHub token step is you only have to do this once um, per system that you're trying to use. Seems like I was a little bit too aggressive with cleaning things up again when preparing for the tutorial. So make sure it has the the repo permissions and the gist permissions. You generate the token 
you copy paste it. And then in here, okay, let me move this back here. So now I have an additional token created here. I copy pasted it and I can give it to easy build by using install GitHub token. I copy paste it, I hit enter. Easy build validates the token It makes sure it's a correct token. And it asks me for a password to protect it. So I'll enter a password here. And whenever I want to use this token, I'll have to enter the password again. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with this, of course, because this gives access to your GitHub account. Uh, so that's a bit of setup. Um, creating the token, giving it to easy build by installing it. You should only have to do this once um, for the next times easy build will pick up on it. So that's a little bit of setup you have to do um, to make sure that everything is okay. We have this check GitHub option you can run it's properly configured it tells okay i will use the ev tutorial github account i will try to use the token so you'll need to unlock the token with your password uh, the token looks okay um, it found the git command it found the git python command now in the background it's doing a test whether it can create a branch and push it into um, your github repository fork that should be working. So the push access was validated. That looks okay. Um, it can create gist files um, with Ableton uses for certain things. And then it says all checks have passed and I can do all these things um, starting right now. So all these GitHub integration features are now enabled and should be fully working. This, this one here is a detail. Uh, this only speeds things up a bit. It doesn't actually add any additional functionality. So we check GitHub, you can make sure that everything is in place. And for example, if I have some configuration missing, so if my GitHub account is not specified, then check GitHub will tell me that it's not there. If the user is not there, it will also not find the token. And then some of these things will not be supported. So that's a very useful uh, way of checking that things are working. So make sure everything is green here or is okay here at least uh, before you continue. Once that is working, we can start playing. Um, so what can we do now with the GitHub integration? We can create pull requests using the eb command straight away. So we don't have to run any git commands. We don't even have to uh, have a local copy of the easy configs repository. Um, on our system, EasyBuild will do that automatically in the background. Um, and we won't have to click around on GitHub, EasyBuild will also do that for us. There's a lot of information here. The basics of it is to start a new pull request to use EB new PR and EasyBuild will uh, do all the necessary steps for us. Um, I'll skip most of the details here. The important one is PR target account. So to which account should it open um, the pull request, the default is easy builders. Uh, but for the purpose of this tutorial, it's probably better to yeah, use a different target account. So if you want to do this exercise or this demo yourself, please open pull requests into the EP tutorial account itself. So basically here, uh, my fork EB tutorial, easy build, easy configs. I guess it's without a dash, yeah. So when you do this, the R target account equals EB tutorial. If you open a pull request with easy build, it will go in here. So make sure you, you make that uh, uh, configuration change. Otherwise you'll end up here in the central repository um, and your pull request will first of all drown in in between all the other ones, I will get the same pull request from multiple people. Um, so that will look confusing as well. So it's good to avoid that. Make sure you send your pull request here. Um, when you're doing, when you're running EB new PR, you can do a dry run where EasyBuild will show you what it will do, but without actually opening the pull request. So you can double check on yourself. Um, 
that's very useful. And you can also preview a pull request. And then this will give you an, an overview of how your easy config file is different from the ones that are already uh, merged. Once you have opened the pull request, um, maybe you want to make additional changes to it later. You can do EB update PR, where you give it both the new easy config file and the uh, pull request number. So easy build will go to an existing pull request, check out that branch, add your new easy config file to it and push the updates into the pull request again. So also that avoids lots of manual work. And to use a pull request, an existing one, you can use the from PR command line option. So EB from PR and the number will tell easy build, go look into the pull request, download all the easy config files from there and try installing those uh, locally. That's interesting. Um, if you know there's an open pull request or a merged pull request that has something new that you need, um, or it's also interesting to test um, pull requests, to test contributions. And I'll show that in a bit. And the sim similar thing works also for easy blocks. You can also pull in updated easy blocks straight from a pull request, even if they're not a part of your easy build installation. What's very useful when pulling easy config files from a pull request is that you can also upload a test report. So you will not only try the actual installation on your system, but you can also send back a test report into the pull request and let others know that this worked for you. And I will show this in the demo. So that's a whole mouthful, but let's look at what this does. Um, again, make very sure you're targeting the EB tutorial account rather than the default central account when doing this. Um, so check with show config that this is properly set up. Um, I will also do the module use of our software stack here and make sure um, I'm using the build path in temp and the prefix in home because I will be doing a test installation um, as well. So I want to make sure I do that in the right location. Um, and now let's look at the example. So if you want to straight up open the pull request, all you need to do is EB new PR in the name of your easy config file. Here, I'll be a little bit more careful. I want to do a dry run first. Uh, so remember, this is an easy config file for EB tutorial version 1.1. Uh, which should be fully working. This was tested in one of the previous sessions. So this is the easy config file I want to contribute back. I can do a dry run with new PR. Easy build goes in the, into the background and sets up the, the branch in my uh, fork of my easy configs repository. It will uh, make sure that this file is not only copied into the correct place, but also has the correct file name. Um, it will set up a branch for me. It wants to talk to GitHub, so it asks me for unlocking my GitHub token. And then here it says, this is dry run mode, so this is not actually done yet. Um, but it will be targeting, this looks wrong. This should be EB tutorial, but I think it's just a dry run lying to me. Um, what has it done? It will say, it will create a branch for me. It figures out a proper title for the pull request. It has copied this example, easy config file to this location with the correct file name based on the contents of the file. Um, and without dry run, it will actually go and push this into uh, GitHub. So why did it get the target wrong? Ah, I have actually set this up, okay. Yeah, make sure the PR target account is correct. So that's why it's useful to do a dry run. Let's do it again. And now it should tell me that the target is indeed EB tutorial. So it doesn't hurt to double check before you open the pull request. It's, it's so easy that you can easily do something unintended as well. Yeah, this looks better. Uh, it will open the pull request to the develop branch of the EB tutorial fork so let's go ahead and do that without the dry run 
the output look almost the same, but we should now see a pull request popping up in here once it completes. So EasyBuild is not only doing the necessary Git commands to create the branch, to do the commit, to do the push to GitHub, but it's also doing the equivalent of clicking around in GitHub to open the pull request. And it doesn't have my token, why? Maybe I mistyped my password. Must have mistyped my password, try again. So it needs the token, of course, to automate the interaction with GitHub. So this, this step here takes a while because it's downloading um, a fresh clone from GitHub. It does a, um, a fresh clone in the temporary directory. This is the part that you can speed up uh, by telling EasyBuild where you already have this clone available on your system, then it won't take that long uh, because it's, it's downloading quite a bit of stuff in here. Setting up the branch. Now let's make sure I get my password correct. Yeah, that's better. So now it's actually going ahead and opening the pull request. This all looks the same from the dry run, but now we get a link. And if we just refresh here, we will see the pull request opened. Um, click on the pull request and check what changed. So notice it has guessed a decent pull request title for us. It has put the file in the right place. Uh, it has also come up with a pretty decent um, git commit message. So it's telling us we're adding easy config files and these are the ones that are being added. So this looks pretty good. This is the first step, opening the pull request. Um, we can now go, go ahead and actually test this as well. So if you do from PR and the pull request number, which is number three, EasyBuild will check on GitHub um, which easy config files are there and it will try to do the installation. Yeah, so it pulls down this easy config file, it puts it in a temporary directory somewhere and then it tries to do the installation. Of course, you need to be a little bit careful when doing this, especially when the pull request is still open. Um, you don't want to do this blindly, but this seems to work. That's good. And we can even do a rebuild and upload test report. So this will do the installation again. It's my GitHub token again. It will do the installation again. Um, and then it will also upload the test report into this pull request. So we should see an additional comment popping up here um, when that installation is complete. Yeah, there it goes. So this adds a new comment for me. It tells me on what type of system uh, this installation was done, what type of CPU, and it gives me a link to this gist file. And in the gist file, it gives me more details, how long it took, what was installed, which easy build version, which easy build configuration. So this is a dump of the full configuration, what type of system was used and so on. So this is all very useful information for people who are testing each other's contributions. Uh, so this explains all of that, um, uploading a test report with from PR uh, is very easy as well. And we get a comment like this and it just that matches it. So this uh, also concludes this part. I don't think I have anything additional in here, no. So any questions on, on this? We've made it as easy as possible to contribute back to EasyBuild. I don't think we can do a lot better here. One, one question, I guess. So it was not entirely clear to me, but it's, it seems like the concept when you use the, the, the quick tool here is that you submit one, one file at a time. So for, for easy block, you give it an easy block and that, that's like one file, one commit. But I think for easy configs, it looked like it took everything that you have changed in your easy configs directory, right? But I, I suppose the best practice here is just to commit one uh, easy config at a time, right? Well, it, it, it takes, 
when I created a pull request, I gave it the name of the easy config file. So it only takes this one, not the full directory, just this particular easy config file. You can give it multiple easy config files and the same EB new PR command, and then it will pack everything together in a single pull request. Oh, okay. Two, three, four, five easy config files is okay. It can actually do this as well. If you combine new PR with robot, um, let's see, can I, if I do missing, yeah, this is a bad example, I guess, because um, there's only one thing missing. and Actually, there's nothing missing anymore because of the, the test installation. But when, when you combine it with robot, easy build will resolve the dependencies. It will check which easy config files are not available yet in the repository that you're sending the pull request to. And all the easy config files that are needed, all the missing bits, it will combine them together in the single pull request. So if this one needs two dependencies and these dependencies are not in easy build yet, it will add the easy config files for these dependencies as well. And you basically get yeah, everything that is needed to install the software. Um, so you, you don't want to spread things over multiple pull requests, one easy config file per pull request, because that would be way too, way too many pull requests. And also the, the CI would fail for everything that depends on something else. So typically you want to pack things together a little bit at least. Okay, I see. Um, and we, we already get 2,000 pull requests a year for easy config, so we, we don't want to get more uh, if that's not really needed. Anyway, we probably won't be using the common tool chain, so it doesn't make much sense to uh, contribute to the central repository. But I guess with some careful configuration, it may be useful either to have people from associated teams contributing to our easy config repository, or if in case some sites that all have craze would collaborate on setting up a common repository for the gray tool chains to contribute yep. to that one. Yeah, of course. So it, it, it just does the pull request to the central repository by default, uh, but you can reconfigure it to... Yeah, I've noticed there was an environment variable to tell to which, uh, I mean, yeah. you have actually used it to, to contribute to a bit tutorial instead. Yeah, indeed. So you can you can tweak which account it targets for the pull request. You can change the branch if you only have a, a main or a master branch in your repository. Um, you can even target an entirely different repository, so something that's not called easy build, easy configs, but you do need the same structure the easy build directory, the easy config directory in there. As long as you have that, that will also work. So. There's nothing that hard codes you to do the central contribution. You can manage your own repository through this as well and pull in pull requests with from PR, also from other repositories. That works. That works fine. Uh, so yeah, indeed for for Cray, um, we do have some tool chains in the central repository, but not up to date ones. And CSCS also manages their own uh, repository. I'm not sure if they use this. I think most people there are are familiar enough with Git. That it's not a problem for them. But for it has people a who are not familiar, just so I'm pretty sure they're not using that. No, but you can. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing uh, that prevents. They have you. they have one repository which contains everything, not just easy configs, but also their configuration and so on. Yeah, yeah. You can do that too, as long as you use the same easy build, easy config structure. You can still use new PR and have, have other stuff on the side. Easy build will not touch the other things, of course. Okay. Then if if there's no more questions, we can either wrap up here or if somebody else has questions on anything else related to easy build, I'm happy to take them as well. Um, and if not, we can wrap up here. <laughs>